is currently the cataloging news editor for Cataloging and Classification right. Quarterly. He holds his MLS from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, UWM, and an MS in Geography and English Technical Communication from NSU Mankato. He also moonlights as an adjunct instructor for the Graduate School of Library Information Science at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where he teaches cataloging and classification courses, and he tries to convert at least one student per, sem per semester to the cataloging side of the force. That's kind of what I like to do, cataloging the dark side. So please join me in welcoming Bobby. Hi, everyone. So I think we're ready to go. Um, we're going to talk about moving images today. We're going to talk about um, the kind that you can put in a player. And then we'll also talk about digital ones later on. So um, before we get started, it is Thanksgiving in Canada. So happy Thanksgiving to the Canadians. Um, There we go. I'm going to make it bright enough for me to see what I'm looking at. So um, what I want to talk about today, um, scope-wise, are mo moving images, motion pictures. And we're going to look at the lion in winter um, as an example. And so I've got both the uh, 1968 one, the original motion picture, and then the one that was done in 2003. And so that's what we'll look at, look at today. I think um, I, I have to confess that I, um, when I made these slides and gave them to Mary and she printed them out and you've got a nice um, handout there, when I opened the slides this morning on my computer, the, the sync that happened did not happen. And so I had an earlier, not totally edited version. <laughs> so for the people sitting behind me who saw, who saw me, like that's what I was doing was, was catching up um, getting everything into the right spot. And I have added a couple of other um, couple other slides here, so the numbering will will be off a little bit as we go through. Um, I did want to point out a couple of other resources here that you might want to be aware of. Um, cataloging of audiovisual materials and other special materials, the Nancy Olson Bible from 2008, right? The fifth edition, anyway. Um, even though it's AACR2, there's still a lot of good um, examples in there, and an uh, RDA version will be coming at some point, so keep your eyes out for that. Um, OLAC is, has a great number of resources. Right now, none of their best practices documents are um, written for RDA yet. They are working on those, and I think there are supposed to be a couple of them available as drafts pretty soon. So I, I want to say that the, um, um, to me it seems that, that it's a little slow going for them creating those, but I think a lot of that is just so much uncertainty right now because this is, we're only a couple of months into using RDA and there still aren't a lot of, um, there's still things that we're thinking about and, and working, working out. So, and if you have access to the uh, RDA toolkit, um, one of the things that is in there are workflow documents and the pan-Canadian workflow documents are some of the better ones that are in there. So take a peek at those and they can be pretty helpful. All right, so let's dig in. Um, preferred source of information. So the preferred source of information for a um, moving image, which also will include video games for those of you who catalog video games. Um, so anything that has moving images is the title frames itself. And with video games, they often don't have a title frame, so to speak, sometimes. But sometimes they have a splash screen that comes up. So if you can catch that somehow, um, that might be a place where you can get information. Alternatively, you can use the container if you need to. Um, but as a last resort, you would want to prefer the disk image if you've got a disk itself, or if you've got a VHS, if you're still doing, anyone still doing VHSs out there? No hands, okay. <laughs> um, but if you are doing VHS, um, again, the, the label that's, that's applied or printed on the actual carrier 
would be your, your source of information if you have no way of actually looking at the title frames themselves. So um, only make use of the container as a last resort if you need to. Um, so we're going to look today at uh, mainly examples that come from the Lion in Winter. Um, and I, we've got two works here and a couple of different manifestations and expressions as well so that we can capture some of that um, fun stuff with RDA. Um, some of the other examples are coming from a variety of other types of resources because no one resource actually gives us um, all of the great examples that, that we could possibly need. So what we'll do with this is we'll walk through it um, as if we were cataloging it and we're going to walk through it in RDA fashion. So there are going to be points where you're going to say, but wait, don't we put something here first? We will, but we'll get there because it's, it's not part of the, um, the same order as we're used to doing it in Mark. So the title proper. Um, the title proper is a core element. You've got to have a title. And you want to find something on the uh, chief source of information, preferred source of information, I'm sorry. Um, I still am not <laughs> using that term yet. Uh, it's not ingrained yet. And one of the things that you as an institution have to decide is whether or not you will um, follow Appendix A or if you're going to transcribe it exactly, exactly as you see it um, or, or some variation there, therein. Um, I would say write it down, make a decision and write it down, write every decision down and make sure that it's somewhere that someone else can, can find it because when people leave, um, they want to know and make sure that you state why it is that you made a certain decision, particularly if you're going in some other variation because without a justification, um, then it makes it really difficult to know why was it that, that you were doing these things. And if that justification is because of your system limitation, when you go to another system, you can re-examine that and, and drop it and forget about it, right? So that's a very important thing to, to do. Um, and Adam actually touched on, on the capitalization issue and I know that the all caps things really disturbs a lot of people. They don't like looking at that um, and, and I get that but I think the other thing to remember is that um, there's going to be human created metadata following RDA and there's going to be computer generated mashup data following as much as possible RDA and the computer, whatever gets sucked out of the publisher database or whatever other database is going to come in all sorts of, you know, character ups and downs and, and things like that. So um, uncapitalizing can, will probably become a losing battle, like <laughs> spitting at the sea to raise the level the, of the ocean. So um, pick your battles wisely, I guess is what I would say. Um, in the middle there, you can see one of the things we're going to look at is a, is, is a different expression of um, the Lion in Winter as a work, and it's the Spanish language expression. And so you can see at the bottom, um, they have the, the parallel title there um, as a, as a um, um, not a sub, but what, is, what are those things called? Yes. So, parallel title. Um, transcribe these like you see them. In this particular case, because the lion in winter is first, that's our title proper. So our parallel title proper will end up being what we've got underneath there, and then we'll have our 246 with that parallel title. Um, so that we have access to it that way. So some movies you will end up having the, the um, title proper for that manifestation and that's the key word here, manifestation, would actually be um, the, the language that it's in and then the English might be the parallel, uh, for example, if they have gone ahead and, and changed those title frames. But I think more often than not what we're going to see is the original English and then with the um, 
the, the, the under titles there. Okay. Note on the title proper, um, the ti the, so your preferred source of information is the title frames themselves. So if that's where your pr title proper comes from, you do not need a note. If you take your title proper from any other place on the resource itself or outside the resource itself, you've got to have a note. So you need a 588 field that says, I took the title from whatever spot it was. And so you can be serial cataloger-like and do title from, or you can be book cataloger type and say cover title or something like that. Um, I, I kind of like that version there, although I was not trained as a serial cataloger, but it just looks better to me. Um, statement of responsibility. So this is the one that always gets people with moving images. So um, the statement of responsibility is needs to come from the title frames and it is the people in the corporate bodies and, and whoever has a creative role in the creation of the motion picture, which usually includes producers, but not executive producers. Um, it includes the director, it can include the screenwriter. Depending upon the type of motion picture it is, um, if it's an animated film, you will want the animator. If it is a musical, you will want the, um, the music, so the composer, and you will want the um, lyrics, and you will want the, the lyricist, and you will want the, um, the uh, choreographer, yes. So, that's, um, so those are things to keep in mind. And if you look at the, the box that is under the text there, um, I think actually both of those are, are examples of that. One of the neat things that they do for us on the container, if you look at the back of the container for these DVDs and Blu-rays, they often put um, all of the names of the people and corporate bodies that you need in the exact order and the exact phrasing that we see them, or mostly the exact order and phrasing that we see them on the, um, on the title frames themselves. So what you can do, because they are actually almost too small to read, um, even if you even with your trifocals, um, if you've got a scanner, you can scan that to a PDF or something, and then zoom in on it. Use at least like 350 DPI, but you can scan in, and then you can actually read them, and you don't have to sit there and pause and 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 then try to work backward a little bit to to um, to see what the names are. So that can be a um, a nice way to record these things a little faster. So here's a little more on the statement of responsibility. Um, again, it is core. Uh, the only the, the first named one is the first named person or corporate body is, is actually core, but uh, no one's going to do it that way. I would record all the principal people that were involved for the motion picture. Um, other people that are part of the creation of moving image works, like um, the um, director of photography um, and a couple of other names like that, um, they will actually go, those become expression elements, and we will continue to put those in 511 and 508 notes, so we'll come to those a little bit later. And then this example here that you're seeing is from the, um, the 2003 um, work of The Lion in Winter. So country of producing entity, this is not technically RDA, um, but the people in know say that this is something that we need to start adding again. Um, it's always well, I shouldn't, have, shouldn't say it's always been there, but it's been there for a very long time, this 257 field. Um, I know there's one page I think that is missing, and I think this might be it, because I can tell by the way you're, where is it? So, um, yep. The slide. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think you got one page twice when I was, when I was looking through it, because I did the same thing. Um, so, 
What you can do, 257, you would name the country. So whoever the first, or the, look at the production companies that, are, that you've put in your statement of responsibility. Okay, those, um, where their headquarters are, that's the country of the producing entity. And so you would just go ahead and record them in a 257, yes. And then you'll need to cite your, um, you will need to cite your, your source. So whether you're using the name authority file, United States, or you're using the abbreviation from RDA, US. So Appendix B in RDA is a much smaller list of, um, of abbreviations. So just like we had an Appendix B in AACR2 with a longer list of abbreviations, um, RDA is much shorter, and so there are some countries and, and um, other terms that we still are supposed to abbreviate according to RDA. So abbreviations are not all gone yet, alas. Um, so yeah, go ahead and, and do that. Often it's really difficult to know where the heck these people are based, and so IMDB is your friend. I, and like, if you're going to do um, original cataloging in particular on a motion picture, just pull it up in IMDb right away and save yourself some time because we'll, we'll be going here several times um, through the course of this. Edition statements. So um, some things can have multiple edition statements. And um, so transcribe them like you see them. In this case, it's 25th anniversary edition, so that's what we shall record. Uh, the 250, this is also hot off the press, so in the last mark update, the 250 field is now repeatable. So if you have multiple edition statements on a particular resource, you don't have to contrive some way of putting them together with a comma and, and make it all muckety-muck, um, you know, make it you know, sometimes they come out kind of, um, they don't roll off the tongue easily. So you can actually use multiple 250 statements now, which is a great time saver because you don't have to decide which ones. You'll just have to pick which one you put first, you know. So um, that'll be up to you, whichever is the most important. Okay, so here is where you've got a big error, which is what that big red arrow is for. So um, all of you have got a pen and you can go ahead and correct that because this is the phrase that I can never remember. Um, and so when I was creating these slides, I just put down what it was supposed to be and I said, I will fix that later, and I didn't. <laughs> so what it should be um, for a publication statement, so you want to record publication statement is core, the place is core, the publisher name is core, the date is core. And so Adam has already given you all the instructions you need on how to finagle this with um, when there is no place and if you can create a place and then, or identify a place and certainly do that. Um, and the same with the date of, of publication. But um, this is one way to do that. So, you know, you, in, in point of fact, what we would probably do with this one is put United States because um, it's pretty, pretty damn certain that MGM Home Entertainment is, is the United States, so you would do that. But um, in California, yeah, probably so. so. But I wanted to do that so that, that you can see how this actually works in practice. If you, don't, um, if you don't have a place and you're very uncertain, you can go ahead and, and use that uh, in square brackets. And then the, the second example here, so the Spanish language version is um, was Mexico. Mexico City is what it actually is, but it says Mexico, that's it, and so that's what we would record in our statement, or in our place of publication there. So the distribution statement is core if you don't have publication. So this is a core if um, type of, type of uh, situation. So you don't have to record the distributor. But if you've got the distributor, go ahead and do it anyway. Um, usually you're going to have some sort of statement, um, which in that blurry picture down at the bottom there, it does say distributed or distributor. 
um, distributed by MGM Home Entertainment. So that is where you would, uh, that's your evidence and that's how you would record it. It will be a 264 second indicator 2. So with the 264, those indicators are super duper important. Um, they, they define what's going in there, so you need to make sure to uh, be on top of those indicators when you record them. And again, um, we, we don't know the actual date that this was distributed, um, so we are supplying 2000, and we're doing that based on the copyright date. So on the disc itself, we've got a copyright date of uh, 2000. No, we have a copyright date of 1968. On the container, we have a copyright date for the container for the artwork of 2000. So that's where I was basing my publication date of 2000. Um, for a Blu-ray or a DVD, be absolutely certain when you do the date of publication or the date of distribution that it is a date during which a DVD or Blu-ray could have existed. <laughs> Um, we could never use 1968 because they, they didn't even have VHS then. Um, the, the DVD was 91, I think, 1991, and Blu-ray was 2000s at, at some point in there. So um, be very sure of those dates when, when you do them. And then for the fixed fields, um, what you will end up needing to do is in your DTST spots, You'll use T if you've got two, if you've got both a pub date and a copyright date, you're going to use T. Your publication date will go in that first date box, the publication date. The copyright date will go in the, the latter, in the date two box, okay? So that's how that would work. And that's the same, so when you're doing a book and you've got publication and copyright and they're the same year, even for, a, um, for, for anything, it doesn't matter what it is, you can have the same year in both because what you're doing with that T is stating that the first one is the publication and the second one is the copyright. So that's what's going on there. So a little more about the copyright date. Um, this is also hot off the press because this was a change that was made in July, in the July update. Um, in the past, in the, in the previous iteration of RDA, you could only record one copyright date and you were done. So you had to choose and that was it. But there are instances where it's important that you, um, or where you have two different copyright dates for two different things. And in this case, so we've got copyright 1968 that applies to the film. So I use the subfield 3 to state that this is the film. And then um, I use the copyright 2000, which is the copyright for the design on the container. So you could also add um, design, container design, if you wanted to be more specific in that case. So, I mean, I think to us as catalogers, that helps when we see these things, because we can know where the heck that person got this particular date from, um, particularly when you have the, the newer version of the container um, for this year's Christmas shopping spree when they dug them out and, and spruced them up for whatever reason. Um, you will also notice the subfield 8 there. And the subfield 8, so I put this in to um, make things more complicated for you now. For, um, for the, the reason that what the subfield 8 in the MARC format does, all it does is it links things together. So the subfield 8 for that 264 pairs with the subfield 8 in, the, in that 500 to, to put them together. So um, you, the only thing you can put in the copyright date is the copyright date. That's it. You're done. But there may be occasions when you want to add a little more information about uh, the copyright information that's there. Maybe it's important for you for whatever reason. Probably not for motion pictures and things like that, but there may be other times when it's important to know who the rights holder is and then you can just make a note about that and then um, the subfield 8 can link those together if you've got more than one copyright statement happening there. 
identifier for the manifestation um, for moving images for, for video recordings. Um, it's not been common until very recently that we would have ISBNs on them. That's, that's a very new thing to, to almost consistently have an ISBN uh, more often than not. So go ahead and record that. We would, of course, drop ISBN and the hyphens and just do the number. Um, and then they often have all sorts of other little hidden numbers here and there, sometimes on the spine, sometimes above the UPC code, sometimes down in the bottom corner. You just find like this random number that's just there and, um, and you don't know what do they mean by this. And so um, if you've got something like that, so you see the little lion right there in the, the middle picture, there's one of those random numbers that's in the lower um, left corner of the container. And it's a publisher number. Um, who knows what they use it for necessarily, but you can certainly go ahead and, and record that. It helps identify this manifestation um, so that you know when you're looking at the record that this is the same one. All right, so media type. The media type is core. Um, it's a categorization of basically what kind of device do you need to, to do this, to, to use this resource. And in this particular case, um, we are using a term from 3.2. It's actually, I'm sorry, it is not core. It is core for the Library of Congress, if I got that right, yes. Um, so you would need to decide whether you want to record it or not. Um, the Library of Congress is and um, I would think that you would want this, it would be helpful. So in this particular case, it's a video, and as Adam was saying, the, um, if you use um, OCLC connection clients, there are macros that will do this for you, that will add the subfield B code for you so you don't have to type anything, it'll just pop it in there and, and you're good to go. It's very handy um, and very fast. Carrier type is core, is a core resource, yes. And um, my slides are very tiny, so it's very hard to see them on here. Um, again, what you've got in this is if we go to 3.3, .3, there's a table, um, a bunch of terms, and they're broken out by media type. So um, your video carriers, for example, have a, a carrier type of a choice list, so you've got a menu there that you can choose from. RDA is all about vocabulary, so everywhere we go, almost it seems like there's this little list of, of vocabulary terms that you get to choose from. And um, while you can stray from those from time to time, it is um, it's probably in everyone's best interest to not do that, because the more you stray, um, the harder it is going to be to, to clean it up when they really start making use of these when we get into bib frame or, or something that is not MARC. So your options for video carriers are video cartridge, video cassette, video disc, and videotape reel. Uh, so you notice that they are adding all of these legacy type of items. And again, this is because um, we're going to, because there's no, you know, you, you can get these legacy items at any time in, in life, right? But also, we're going to move backward and, and add these to all the records in OCLC. So these will get added on later. And then there's extent. Um, so extent is a funny little thing because it's both a number and a unit name together that comprise it. And for most things, for most most resources that you catalog, the extent term is going to be used, um, is, is the term that is coming from the carrier vocabulary. But there are certain types of resources, particularly um, still images and cartographic resources, where they actually have in RDA a separate vocabulary for the extent. So be sure when you're doing other types of resources that you look 
um, at that extent role because there will be extent of still image, extent of cartographic resource, and there will be other vocabulary terms in there for you for those particular ones. But in this case, um, we're going to use what we had from the um, from the, the, the carrier list, and that is video disc. So here, um, the DVD or the Blu-ray that we're cataloging has two discs, so we'll say two video discs, because that's what's included there. And um, the thing that you can do if you want to, RDA says that you can, you could use common terminology, so you could say two Blu-ray discs. I would discourage you from doing that. Um, Blu-ray, DVD, whatever format it is, there is a place to record that. Uh, there's, and, and we'll get it to display some way, somehow. But um, the, again, the more we deviate from these standard vocabularies, the more we could be in trouble at some point. So um, pick and choose, be, be mindful and thoughtful about when you choose to stray and document that decision, why you did it, and be consistent about your choice. Dimensions um, for a film and video cassettes, you will measure the width of the tape itself. Um, and if you're going to use metric, so this is what's funny about um, RDA and the Library of Congress. It's for film and video cassettes. So RDA, in an attempt to be international, only tells us about using metric for the most part, right? It does talk about um, imperial units if you want to use those, and the Library of Congress wants to use those, but by and large, um, in, in dimensions, it, it's telling us to use metric. And so for film and video cassettes, it tells us to use metric, and uh, 13 millimeters is what you would use for a VHS tape. There is no, um, the last time I looked, which was before July, so I don't think it's been added, but the Library of Congress did not say anything about using imperial units for video cassettes, but they do want to use it for discs. I don't know why. Um, maybe, they're not, maybe they're not collecting VHSs at all, and so they decided that we're not even going to bother with that. Um, so RDA tells us to record the diameter of the disc in um, in centimeters, so 12 centimeters is that diameter. However, if you are going to follow the Library of Congress, you would use three and three quarter inches. And um, so Adam gave us some new news here that, the, um, that there may be a, a, a policy statement coming, coming right, about, the, about the, um, the end punctuation. So, to my mind, you know, I know this was a big deal on, on AutoCAD. I heard about it because I won't read AutoCAD because it just is too insane. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, when you think about it, the spelling is IN period and the mark stuff is the mark stuff. And if the computer is going to strip things and if it were to strip that period, you would have IN with no period if you only had one. So. You know, the computers can only do what we tell them to do, so we'll see what happens. Do what you want to do, because you know in the end, if you've got two periods or one, it's not the end of the world. <laughs> Nothing will blow up. It will all be okay. It's not Armageddon, right. It's not. <laughs> okay, so this is a slide you don't have, so don't go looking. Um, I added it because of um, um, when we were talking at lunch and um, the, the dreaded um, combo pack came up. I said, oh, you know, we should, we should talk about that a little bit. So very briefly in here, um, the OCLC Bibliographic Formats and Standards in Chapter 4, um, that's, I would just, there's the URL, but you guys all know how to get there, I'm sure. Go to Chapter 4, they talk about this. Um, there, was a, there was a quality control tip of the month or whatnot that I think it's come out twice because they recycle them sometimes on, on various discussion lists about this. But with RDA, um, you have multiple options of what you can do. So when you have accompanying material, you can do 
the 300 plus subfield E, where you put the accompanying material in subfield E. Um, you can dispense with subfield E and just do a, um, a 500 note. You can do a 500 note and subfield E. You can do multiple 300 fields and use a subfield 3 to, um, to differentiate what's in them if you need to. Or you can just do separate records for each of those things as well. So it just really depends on what your needs are. And one of the reasons that they've sent this out a couple of times is that, um, is, is that they want people to recognize that, this, that there are multiple different ways to do accompanying material and that um, if it's done one way, for example, separate records, um, it's not a duplication of the record where it's included in the, in the 300 field. So, um, so watch those types of things for accompanying material. Okay, now you do have this slide. So. Um, sound characteristics. So this is where we really start going into um, things that are very new with RDA. And, and it's all coming from vocabularies and they actually, they being Marby, had to create um, new mark tags for us in which to encode this data. So for sound characteristic, um, and if we go into chapter three of RDA, there are four different characteristics that are going on there. So we're going to start with sound and because it's the, I think it's the first one listed actually. Um, and what you do is you record the different elements that are available to you um, and, and that are in your face on the container, on the information that you have to record this information. So we're going to use 344 as the mark tag that you will use. There's no indicators other than blank, so that's all you have to remember. Um, the nice part about the sound characteristics in RDA is that the, the rule that tells us which type of characteristics there are, they list them in A, B, C, D, E, F, G order, and in mark they have um, made those subfields correspond. So that's actually kind of helpful to, to, to look at it and, and know that, okay, for this particular data element that is A in the list, it's going to be subfield A in the mark format. So that's as much as I can normally remember, and then I have to go look this tag up every time. Um, it has not stuck into my memory yet. So, um, What do we want to know about this in particular? Subfield H is, is the one that will probably apply the most for video recordings. The, the other elements in sound characteristic are generally for audio recordings, not video recordings, but because sound is a part of the video recording itself, there are things that you will need to record. And that's typically going to be the um, what type of sound it is, usually some um, wonderful something point one surround sound and, uh, and then whatever um, format that it's being delivered in DTS digital surround or any of those types of things, master audio. And then we'll use subfield 2 RDA at the end to, to, to indicate that we are following the RDA vocabulary for these things. Video characteristic from 3.18 RDA. So this is actually a very short, um, there's a lot of text there, but this is a very short type of thing. Basically, and we'll just go to the next slide, um, what we're trying to decide is what the video format is and what the broadcast standard is. And so the video format um, is usually going to be something like laser optical, or magnetic, or I think laser magnetic. There's three choices that you can choose, or, or magneto optical, or something, something weird like that. Um, and then you can, if you've got that information and know it, you can add the 1080p, 780p, whatever that might be, high definition, uh, to the um, recording format. And then they also want to know 
what the broadcast standard is. Now the broadcast standard is not always um, recorded and in particular on, on DVDs and Blu-rays. A DVD and VHSs I think are all NTSC, which is the American version. PALS is the European version of the broadcast standard. So basically it's what type of television or monitor you need for, for, for viewing it. And then um, Blu-ray, for example, or probably anything that is 1080p across the board, don't quote me on that, but that would be my guess of what's going on. It's not NTSC, it's, um, it's, it's high definition or, no, it's HD, it's HD, HD TV, not HG TV, HD TV, HD TV. That's what you would record there. But they don't say HD TV, so that's why, if it's not there, and don't worry about it, just, just omit it. So, a lot of this is no worry kind of stuff. If the information's not there, you really can't um, be held accountable for something that you can't see and so can't record. Um, the digital file characteristics, however, um, you would not think that this would apply to a Blu-ray or DVD because they really aren't actually digital, but there are some elements that they, um, for whatever they were on that day, decided were digital file characteristics. I don't know why. Um, so here's the list. Again, it's an ABCD type of thing, and the, the, the subfields in that particular mark tag follow it. And here's an example um, of what it looks like. And so this is just element by element. They would actually all go in, in one three, four, seven fields, so that's what we're seeing on the bottom is just those pieces put together, um, but I wanted to single them out so that you could uh, tell. And video file, um, while I wouldn't necessarily call a DVD or a Blu-ray a video file, um, I think the last time that I tried to do one of these in OCLC and validate it, um, it required a subfield A, and I think this is a tag that required the subfield A, um, so it wouldn't let me just do Blu-ray um, region A, that I, I had to have a subfield A, I think this is the one, I could be mistaken, but um, you can just do that. And so Blu-rays are actually, instead of numbers, they're letters, and there's only three, A, B, and C. So those are the only ones that are available. So record what you see. That's often what they look like, an A in a little stylized um, globe in a, in a stop sign that's been tipped over. So, <clears throat> so here's some examples, um, sound, video, and digital file characteristics. So we can see um, 344, 346, 347. And now, Use your imagination, leave the words up there, but peel off the mark. That's what a lot of our OPACs do with this. So it's just information that's just thrown up on the screen. There's no context, there's no labels, there's no nothing. And um, I know this is one of the things that we're struggling with in, in my consortium, and so we're looking at some ways to um, create labels in using ViewFind to create some labels that would actually label this data um, because the, I don't, I, I don't have very much, call me a cynic, but I don't have much faith in the vendors to be on this very quickly. <laughs> so I think it's gonna be up to us to do some stuff. Um, so, you know, there's that. And what you may need to do, so this is why the little documentation sign is there, you may need to think about this because this is a system display issue. Do make sure that you've got your data encoded in these new fields, 344, 347, 348, whatever they are, um, for these characteristics. You want them in that coded format. But you may also want to, in the interim, make a documented note that for your OPAC display, you want to continue using the 538 and put that information in there because 
that is something that patrons are a little more familiar with. Um, you can do it in a, in a manner that that's, makes a little more sense. So think about that. That's a local decision. This is not something you have to do. Um, the, the 344, these characteristic fields, 344, 345, 346, 347, would only, are the only things that we need to use. You do not need a 538. I want to be clear about that. You might want to choose to additionally use a 538 if you need to until systems can start displaying things because the 538 is at least an easy thing to delete um, later on if you have to do that. Okay. So RDA chapter four um, is a little tiny chapter with a bunch of stuff in there. And there really just are no distinct changes in this information from the way we have been doing it to the way RDA wants us to do it. It's just that they have put it, um, they've, they've actually put some things in here that we um, haven't necessarily had before, um, like, the, like the 856, so that was never part of um, AACR2. But they've got it in here. And terms of availability, so I think the policy statement on that says don't apply them, so don't add the, you know, the price and things like that, but that's what the, the rules will tell you to do. Um, but none of this stuff is new um, and, and none of it is different. So the main thing is um, to keep local information local, so don't put your local information in the master record in, in OCLC. So meaning that, that we don't want your proxy URLs in the 856, because those are really a pain to strip out <laughs> um, when you've got, a, when you've got a, a record set from because of you just bought, say, the, the Springer eBooks, for example. OK, so we're moving now um, out of the manifestation realm into expressions. And so in the lower left of the screen, I've tried to um, keep track of where you are in the Ferber realm. So we've just left manifestations and we're moving into expressions. So the content type, even though in the mark tagging it's the first number, um, in Ferber world and RDA world, it's actually after the other um, its other, its cousins there, the, the media and the carrier. So it is an expression level element. Um, you can use as many of these as you need to use. Again, uh, for, for these DVDs and Blu-rays, it's going to be a two-dimensional moving image. If you happen to have a 3D um, Blu-ray player and television sets, you can buy some of these movies on 3D Blu-rays. And so that would be a, a three-dimensional moving image. Um, now, we know that no patron comes in asking for two-dimensional moving images. <laughs> um, but I think it's also important to recognize this, and this was clearly stated in the, in the final report from the um, RDA testing, the U.S. National Testing document, uh, that the content media carrier vocabulary were never meant to be displayed to patrons. They're, they're meant to be used by the computer to do stuff. So um, I know, for example, that um, I think Ohio State, is, who is on a Millennium, I think, the one, the OPAC that likes all the icons, and they love their icons, and so they're working on mapping their icons to a lot of these, um, these vocabularies for the content media and carrier. So if you're on one of those systems, keep an eye for that because that, that might actually come about. I know we, I'm on Aleph at, at my um, consortium and um, we have something that we call um, content terminology. We do it this way because they're in, they display in angle brackets and so we thought this was a great way to do it. Um, and right now they're all written on, on fixed fields, but we're doing a, a test of, of this vocabulary in our 
development server to see how they might work um, to do the same thing. And it's actually kind of difficult because it's, it's kind of difficult for the computer to decide um, which one of these terms when you have multiples that it's going to use. So um, Mark is kind of confusing to the computer with some of this type of stuff, but don't worry about that, record it. One day, it'll work, one day. <laughs> Intended audience, um, again, another expression element, and for the moving image world, um, that usually is the ever so um, unpopular MPAA, um, who come up with some interesting types of um, ratings for certain things. And um, I mean, I've seen many things that I don't know why they call that a PG, because it scared the heck out of me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you can see it says PG, and then in the box beneath that, it gives you their reasoning for, for why. So you can go ahead and you can include that. There's no, you can do that any way you want to do it. Um, you don't need the MPA rating in front of that. You can just say PG. Uh, you can say MPA reading PG. You can add the re their reasoning why. You can do that in parentheses or not. This is up to you. Um, there is no best practice on this. RDA doesn't tell us how to record it. It just says, you know, record something if you need to. So. Um, it is core for the Library of Congress for juvenile materials. So when you have um, movies for kids, you do need to have um, an intended audience, a 521 note on those. So summarization of content, uh, the 520 field in the MARC format. Um, if you go to the policy statement for this in, in RDA, um, the, the LC PCC policy statement, they have a really nice descriptive instruction handy guide to how to create these in an objective manner. Um, often what I do is, is go to a website or um, IMDB in particular and um, some of the IMDB in your packet, your, um, your 520 is a bit longer. This is, this is the one that I stole out of it today. So um, in my attempt to make things match what you had, but it's basically the same thing. Um, and what you can do when you do these things is if you, you can copy and paste it. Um, I tend to edit out superlatives so that it's not the greatest, most wonderful, insightful, or whatever um, that it happens, they happen to describe it with just to, to make it objective. And um, so that works really well, a copy and paste. You can certainly go ahead and, and attribute it to IMDB or Amazon or Barnes & Noble or wherever you happen to plagiarize that from. Um, <laughs> totally go ahead and do that. Okay. All right. Place and date of capture. This is not at all mandatory. It's just something that you can do. Um, again, IMDB often tells you where a moving image um, was created in some fashion. Um, and there are two different ways that you can do it. You can do it in a more structured way using subfields that are very particular about what element goes in there. Or you can just do a plain old subfield A and, and record it you know, the way that um, that it's written somehow. And so, you know, for most motion pictures, probably not all that important, but there are some where you might want to know, you know, what the actual setting was, because in The Lion in Winter was in, um, the original one was in Wales, I think, and a, and a couple of other places, northern France. The 2003 was actually in, um, I think the Czech Republic is where they filmed a lot of that. Uh, if I recall correctly. So I didn't update the slide for this one um, because this was a better illustration of, of this in particular. So I think we'll go ahead and we'll end there for